What's coming up next is the uh, presentation by our first keynote speaker on the disruptive innovations in learning by Mr. Stephen Downs, Program Leader, Learning and Performance Support Systems, National Research Council, Canada. I would like to brief you about the um, Dr. Uh, Mr. Stephen Dows, uh, Biodata, uh, from September 2014 to present, uh, he's working uh, as learning and uh, performance support system, information and uh, communications portfolio, Emerging Technologies Division, National Research Council, Canada, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. He's also the program leader, principal researcher, leading to portfolio of research projects related to the design and development of personal learning environments and supportive technology, responsible for fighting and liaising with commercial partners, defining program outcomes and objectives, managing a 22 million US dollars delivering outcomes and reporting to NRC's Senior Executive Committee. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Stephen Downs. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me here to Bangkok today. It is my great pleasure to be able to speak with you and to interact with you, to share your beautiful city and your beautiful country. And it's a great privilege to be able to talk to you today. I want to be able to talk about disruptive innovations in education I'll talk a bit about what I mean by that, I guess what is more commonly meant by that. We will look at some disruptive innovations currently happening in education. I'll also talk about some of the work that I've done. And I want to go beyond the concept of disruptive innovation and talk about transformation in education. So here we go. Let's begin with the idea of innovation itself. What is innovation? A lot of the time people think that innovation is the idea, the having of a new product or a new type of technology. But in the literature on innovation, it's much more than that. Innovation really consists of three things, and we must always keep these three things in mind. Idea, yes. The new process, the new technology, the new market, etc but also the execution of the idea, the work that it takes, the development that it takes, the organization that it takes to realize that idea into a concrete form. And then finally, the benefit. And this is the part of innovation that people do not talk about a lot. What is the benefit of an innovation? What is the value that is created? And here I'm not talking about money, because money is just a medium of exchange. Here I am talking about what purpose an innovation serves. What new capacity or ability does it generate? What need does it fulfill? Let's look for a moment at the idea itself. Because this is the part of innovation we are all most comfortable with. So I'll talk about it briefly and then we'll move on. There are different types of ideas. 
that an innovation can instantiate. It could be a new product, like a device, like a new type of phone or a new computer or a self-driving car or something like that. It could be a change in process, a new material that can be brought into your manufacture to make it cheaper, a new type of way of moving knowledge from here to here, a new type of production system. Henry Ford, for example, when he developed the assembly line, created a process innovation. It could be an organizational in innovation, changing the way you run your company or your institution itself. For example, you might shift from a top-down management style to a flat management style. That might be an example. It could be a market innovation, finding a new place to apply the product or service. Traditionally, we think about expanding markets in Canada. We might say we're expanding into China or something like that. But another way of thinking of it is to change the demographics. Pokemon Go was aimed at younger users, but has, became, has become interesting to people of all ages. Yes, even me. Or it could be a new input, a new type of material, a new kind of process to create a new kind of product. But now let's look at the benefit. And arguably, this is the more important part of the innovation. What need does the innovation serve? There are different ways we could look at that need. For example, we might think of a better quality of experience. In computer devices, for example, it might be a better screen. Uh, it might be uh, better quality audio. 4K, for example, is a type of video image. It might be lower cost. Lower cost in, say, the, the purchase of a book. Or, you know, I use Netflix at home. Netflix gives me movies and television shows at a much lower cost than I would pay otherwise. Could be increased efficiency. People talk about employing standards in order to make it more efficient to move from the creation of learning material to the application of learning material to the testing of learning. Or it could be solutions to specific problems. In education, we have problems of access, of engagement, etc., and innovation might solve those problems. These are the benefits. And it's very important to understand that without a benefit, an idea is not an innovation. It's just an idea. It might be a good idea, but it has to actually address a need. That's the concept of innovation. There are also what Clayton Christensen calls disruptive innovations. So what is a disruptive innovation? What makes it different from the other types of innovation? According to Christensen, an established company will seek more and more to target the higher end customers. In other words, the customers with more money. And to do that, they will add features or aspects to their product and service in order to appeal to them. And they become more and more specialized serving the needs of wealthier customers or wealthier climate clients. So a disruptive innovation looks at that situation, looks at the product, and extracts just those features that are necessary in order to make the product or service work 
for a lower price point. It takes something that we sell to rich people, makes it simple, and makes it cheaper so we can sell it to many more people. And in so doing, it disrupts or upends the existing market. In education, for example, here's the, here's the model, right? Education, more and more over time, serves the needs of rich people. And so they go to MIT, or they go to Oxford, or they go to Harvard, and they pay tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars in tuition. And that market is only a certain size. But if we can take education, extract from it the very basics, so that we can lower the cost and make it more accessible, then we can serve many more people. And this is why many people said that the MOOC is a disruptive innovation. And we're going to talk about that more. But the idea here is it extracts, it really makes it a lot cheaper, and so it's able to serve many more people. And it actually undermines the business models of Harvard and MIT, etc., which is why they are so interested in it. Now, let's think a bit more globally for a moment. Let's think about the different things that create change in our society. Change not just in environment or not just in technology, but in industries like education in general. There are really two kinds of change. The economists and, uh, and the people who talk a lot about disruptive innovation will talk about drivers. These are things that push change. These are things that happen in the world and create the need for change. They might be rising costs, which is what we see in education. They might be events that happen, wars, floods, hurricanes, earthquakes. They might be a crisis, a political crisis, a military crisis, an economic crisis. The financial crash of 2008 was a driver, and it created a need for change. It might be new inventions, or it might simply be growth. We have many more people now. That's one kind of change, one kind of cause of change. But there's another cause of change that people don't talk about nearly as much. And to my mind, it's a much more interesting type of change. And that is called the attractor. The attractor pulls. It doesn't push. The attractor is what creates the need for change. And I've listed a few things. Values, goals, desires, needs. You'll see an association here between the benefits of an innovation and attractors, right? An attractor is almost like the definition of a benefit. The attractor is what pulls the market toward a certain technology or a certain innovation. So we have these two things. Innovation can be thought of as an attractor. Innovation is the response to the attractors, the response to needs, objectives, goals, desires, etc. And it's interesting to me because of the two types of causes of change, drivers and attractors, there is a different property to each of them. The driver pushes, but it pushes out. Anything will do. If, if you have an earthquake, it 
creates chaos in society and you have to do all kinds of different things and you're not really motivated by an objective, you're just trying to respond to a crisis. And changes that are created by drivers are like that. Drivers push out from the center, they create uncertainty, they create chaos. Attractors, on the other hand, bring us toward the center. Attractors motivate us toward order, toward harmony with what we need and what we want. But attractors are very conservative. Attractors seek to preserve what is. They focus on existing values and existing needs. So a change happens out there in the world and the attractors try to bring us back to where we were. So far so good? We're getting somewhere. Whoops. So, what is going to count as innovation in education? Is education, as Clayton Christensen and others have said, ripe for disruption? And what kind of disruption will it be? Let's look at some of the changes in technology that almost function as drivers that did not actually change education very much. Television, video. If I put a video up here, it would be just the same as it was before, right? Portable classrooms. I grew up in a portable classroom, that's why I put it there. Didn't change. A portable classroom, just like a permanent classroom. Learning management systems like Desire to Learn or Blackboard or Saba or a bunch of others. Did they really change education? Not so much. They responded to a technological change, but the attractor drew us back into the traditional system of education except using a computer. Clickers, where you, everybody clicks on a clicker and you see the scores up on the screen. Did that change education? No. Second Life, how many of you remember Second Life? <laughs> yeah, three people. Did not change anything. They were innovations, but they didn't change anything. They responded to benefits, but they did not change learning. So, in 2008, George Siemens and I invented the massive open online course. We did it quite by accident, we admit that. We created a special kind of course that was structured like a network and because we created it in that way, we were able to take an unlimited number of people into the course. And in our first course, we got 2,200 people in the course. We were expecting 20. So like I say, it was a surprise. And in the time since 2008, there have been dozens and dozens of MOOCs, and we have MOOCs being created here in Thailand. And the question is raised, and some people have said, is the MOOC a potential disruptor of education? Is the MOOC a disruptive innovation? And my answer is, it really depends on how you do it. Some MOOCs, like the MOOC that George and I created, might be, but arguably the MOOCs that are created by Coursera and Udacity, etc., are like the kind of changes that respond to attractors. 
A new technology comes along and it pulls it back into existing needs, existing values. And the new technology looks a lot like the old technology. You know, we have to reframe our question. We have to ask what counts as an innovation. If everything ends up the same as it was after the innovation as it was before, we wonder what the point was. We ask, what is the demand for a new thing? And was there a demand for a MOOC? Yes, there was. But what kind of demand was it? Was there a business case for a MOOC? And if so, what kind of case was it? Was there a benefit for people in a MOOC? And what kind of benefit was it? Is it a disruptive innovation or is it something else? And what happens when these things change? What happens when demand, business case, and benefit all change? What do we call it then? Okay, end of part one. Oops, too fast. I'm going to talk a little bit about innovations now. I won't linger on it too long, but I want to list a few of the things that have happened in this year that people are talking about as the next innovations. But when I talk about these, I want you to think to yourselves, what is the benefit? Who is benefiting from these? Who is gaining things? What values are being served? So here's one innovation that has been talked about a lot in the press, machine learning and artificial intelligence. And in machine learning and artificial intelligence, there are three basic, and you know, an expert will tell me, well, no, there are 40, but I'll focus on three basic kinds of technologies. Decision engines, for example, something that will move you through a sequence of learning resources. Pattern recognition, for example, software that might recognize whether you're going to pass a course or fail a course, and cluster detection, intelligence that puts things into groups, like the people who deserve an A on a paper, and the people who deserve a B on a paper, and a people, and so on. So we have these three kinds of machine learning, artificial intelligence, intelligent software. And that leads us directly to what we hear a lot about today, personalization. Personalization is the idea that we can adapt our teaching strategy to the individual. And usually what that means is we adapt the presentation of resources to a person or the presentation of activities to a person. So it uses a lot of rule-based events. For example, if they passed the test, then show them the new material. Otherwise, if they failed the test, show them the same material again. Stuff like that. It also is used to create models of the user. And when you have a model of the user, for example, this person likes to learn visually, this person likes to learn by trying, then that helps with the selection of materials that you want to use. And of course, adaptive learning itself, presenting the material, this material as opposed to that material. We can take this a step further and now we have our handheld devices. Everybody has one, right? Pretty much. Does anyone not have one? Yeah, 
everyone has one. <laughs> and we think now our learning is going to be in our pocket all the time. But really, handheld learning is going to go a step further than that. And here's the innovation. Handheld learning will actually be placed into our devices. You can sort of see a picture of a tennis racket there. Now, I don't play tennis, but the idea is you swing the racket, you hit a ball, it goes over a net. You can be good at that, or you can be bad at that. The idea of this tennis racket is you practice tennis, and there's sensors in the racket, and the sensors provide feedback and that connects to your mobile phone and it gives you lessons to help you improve. You swing, it says, bad swing, try this. You swing, that was better, you did this. And so mobile learning goes right into our devices. Interesting innovation, right? Interesting way of providing more benefit to the user. A lot of people are talking about recognizing the learning that has taken place, maybe with our tennis racket. And we have technology called badges and blockchain. So what is a badge? A badge is a digital certificate that recognizes achievement. It's like a paper certificate except it's digital. And you can store your badges in what's called a backpack and you can display the badges on your web page or maybe on your Facebook page or maybe on a personal profile. But people ask, how do we know the badge is real? Because if you go to my page, you can discover that I'm an expert in neurosurgery and that I have flown to the moon because I have badges for these. No, I'm just kidding. But it's, it's easy for a person to fake a badge. But a blockchain is a mechanism used to authenticate the authenticity of a badge. It's used for digital currency right now, but it can be used for anything, any contract, any exchange, any document. And the idea is you take the transaction, this university grants this badge, you encrypt it, and then you add it to a chain of other encrypted statements, and you make that chain public. And so nobody can change that statement without everybody seeing it. So once your statement is part of the blockchain, it's there forever. It can't be changed. And so you can use a blockchain to authenticate your badge. So we have validated certificates. It's a neat idea. And in fact, it surrounds a whole cluster of ideas. It, or it's part of a, a whole cluster of ideas surrounding this based on the idea of competences and skill system. Now you've probably heard a lot about competences, or sometimes people say competencies. I honestly don't know the difference between them. I think it's just a quirk of English. But the idea is that instead of a, a degree like a Bachelor of Arts or a Doctor of Education or whatever, we break down our domain of expertise into a whole bunch of smaller skills. And these smaller skills are known as competencies. And in a competency, there are basically two parts. One part is the description of the skill or practice or ability. And the other part is the evidence that would be used in order to show that you have achieved this. So right now, organizations like Advanced Distributed Learning in the United States are creating competency systems 
that create a personal profile, and that's what's pictured there, with all the different competencies that you have, like a map of your skills. Something you need, maybe? Is there a benefit there for you? And so overall, we'll end up with what I call a personal learning record, which will have your activities, will have your portfolio, your artifacts, etc., your badges, your certificates, your credentials, and all of your educational activities will be represented digitally, and other people can see them. Another innovation that people talk about a lot there's really two parts to this. The one part of it is the games, the simulations, virtual reality. Remember Oculus Rift has come out recently. That's the headset you put over your eyes and you see a 3D virtual world and you're on a roller coaster or you're in a forest or whatever. And we can use these, we can use simulations, we can use games in order to facilitate learning. And there's two major types here. Gamification, where we add elements of games like keeping points and tracking progress. We add that to learning. Or there are what are called serious games, where you design a whole game, but it has a learning element to it. So a lot of people like these. The second part is what is called learning tools interoperability. And the idea here is that you're in your learning management system and if you use LTI, it can pop you out of your learning management system and into a simulation and then you go back to your learning management system. And that's another innovation. That one's being developed by IMS Global. IMS stood for Instructional Management Systems. Does that sound exciting to you? Yeah, kind of. And then finally, we are working toward, in educational technology, translation, automated translation. And it won't be long where if you preferred to listen to me in Thai rather than English, that you could just put your mobile phone on the desk and put your earphone in and I would speak and your phone would translate. Or if I sent you a message the communication system would automatically translate for you. That would be really nice, actually. I'm looking forward to that. And there are communication and what they call collaborative technologies that allow people to work on things at the same time. Google Docs is a good example of that, where two, three, four people can edit the same document at the same time. And there are numerous systems now for example, Slack, which allow teams of people to work together. Okay, so that's overall, that's the landscape. And it's a pretty exciting landscape. There are some really interesting technologies that are being developed. But if you're like me, and some of you might be like me, you're looking at those and you're saying, yeah, those are really interesting and maybe even useful, but they're attractors. They, they pull us back to the same model of education with the same problems. They don't change. And they're, they're interesting and useful, but they're not exciting. And I think there's an area of need, an area of benefit not being addressed. And that's why I want to talk about transformations. 
You know, let's think about this. I work as a researcher. I do research and development. And traditional research and development means you try to, you know, you're looking for an effect, like an increased test score. And you try a new technology and you have a control group and a test group and you run your course with your new technology and then you compare the results. And if the outcomes are increased, then your technology is a good technology. And that's the kind of thing that is leading to these technologies that I just talked about. But science, real science, as compared to what is done in education schools, is much more than that. Real science is a whole community working and interacting together, not doing simple standalone tests, but interacting, comparing notes, playing around with models, creating structures of knowledge communicating through explanation and arguments, papers and seminars, and as always, practical demonstrations. We are told that there are certain stages of innovation. We are told, first you invent something, then you make it, then you sell it. But in the real world, it's actually the opposite. First, you sell it, then you make it, and then you realize you've invented something. That's why MIT always makes its product announcements before it's made the product. Always. The big announcement from MIT is, we are going to do this. They're selling. What are they doing? Why would you sell first? Well, because you're trying to manipulate the benefit. You are trying to create a demand where none exists. MIT says, we are going to invent a new type of MOOC. I say MIT. It could be Stanford. could be, I don't know, Princeton, Oxford, whatever. They are creating needs. They're saying, you need this kind of thing. That's what they're doing. They tell us that we proceed from the concept to the prototype, like the pilot test, for example. You take a small group of people and try your innovation to the proof, right? You scale it up, you deploy it. But I work in networks. A network at a small scale works very differently from a network at a large scale. Imagine a telephone. How useful would a telephone be if you could only talk to 20 people with it, as compared to how useful it is when you can talk to a million people with it? If we tested, if we did a pilot test of the telephone, it would be useless. No. We have to go beyond innovation. This is a key slide. This is the one I made this morning. So let's think about this. In traditional innovation, we begin with drivers and attractors, whatever they may be, creating the idea plus the execution plus the benefit and that produces the innovation. But that innovation is very conservative, very traditional and does not change what we are trying to do. And I'll talk about that in a bit. If we go beyond innovation, what changes, what is new is we define a new type of benefit. I remember the different types of benefits that we talked about before. And then we do the idea and execution and we get transformation. We don't have the same thing after. 
So if I applied this to education, and I will, traditional innovation means we have the idea, we have the execution, we have the new technology, and we deploy it, and we have the same kind of education system we had after. Same institutions, same classes, same model of learning. But if we change what we are trying to do, then our understanding of education is transformed. All right. What do I mean by that? What I mean is, in transformation, and this is not just my ideas, I'm borrowing here from other people who have defined transformation. In an organizational context, it's a series of radical changes that actually changes the direction of the organization. If you think about it from a university context, Traditionally, we deliver education. Now, we do something new. What, what is that? Well, I'll talk about that. Transformation implies a basic change of character and little or no resemblance to the past configuration or structure. It's a change in the nature of the thing. So. Let's put this into context. Here's Microsoft's vision that they came out with not too long ago, just late last year, for the new model of education. Learning community, teacher capacity, efficient schools, personalization, physical learning environments, curriculum, and assessment. Well. Is that changing anything? This is not transformation. This is innovation. But it's just doing the same thing we have always done. And the key question here is, are these things, the six things that are Microsoft's vision, are these the benefits that we really want out of this innovation. You know, and you begin to ask when you look at that, because I would say no, I mean, maybe parts of it, but this really isn't, you know, when I think of education, I'm not thinking of these things. I'm thinking of knowledge and empowerment and making my way in the world and being successful and being happy. None of that. And I begin to ask, whose benefit is Microsoft's picture working toward? Oops. Here are some questions to ask. You have probably heard of Maslow's hierarchy. Maslow's hierarchy defines the benefits or goals that people work toward. They, it defines the fundamental structure, therefore, of innovation. You begin with physiological needs, food, water, etc., air, air is important, and then safety and security, and then belonging, and then self-esteem, and then self-actualization. These are, Maslow says, what you want and need. I can't read that. <laughs> oh, okay. And I ask, are these the things you really want? Is it really in that order? Maybe belonging is the most important thing to you. Maybe self-actualization is nice, but not necessary. Maybe Wi-Fi is the most important thing in your life. And I know it's the most important thing in my life. It's not up to Maslow to tell us what our benefits are. But now we're looking at the right kind of question. Now we're looking at what we need to be thinking about when we're talking about educational innovation and educational transformation. Look at how education has actually changed through the years 
and you see a story of changing benefits. Way in the history of time, prehistoric time, pre-civilization time, education was about past needs. I was walking in the woods and I had to kill a tiger, so this is what I did. Storytelling. Storytelling tells about what was needed in the past. But then we became a farming society, a building society, and we needed to employ our children to help us, otherwise we would starve. So it was all about present needs. You, child, here is how you grind the mill, grind the, the wheat, grind the rice, whatever. You do this now, because we need this now. With industrialization, the benefit changed again, and so did the model of education. And it was for future needs, to prepare people to go from school to work in the factory. You must be on time. You must listen to instructions. You must follow the procedure. You must work to a standard. You must be able to read instructions. You must be able to calculate and do mathematics. Future needs, factory needs. School, then work. And then in today's model of academic learning, we are serving potential needs. Learn algebra because you might need it in university. Learn linguistics so that you can understand different ways of describing things. It's the possibility. So what are the benefits beyond these? Well, I think there's two kinds. I'm speculating. On the one hand, my needs, whatever they are. How can I become a knowing person? And related to that, our needs as a community, as a society. How can we create new knowledge together? So it's a totally different kind of benefit. And that leads us to our transformations. And I know I'm almost at the end. Here are the real issues in education. Students pay too much. Tests and exams are unreliable and often unfair. The stuff we need is locked behind a paywall. The content is poorly communicated and our interactions with each other as students and participants in education are difficult, if not impossible. It's really stressful to learn. The research about education is very poorly designed and it practically never replicates anyways. It's all people making stuff up. We need to think about new models of deployment. Instead of try a pilot test and do something, try a pilot test and do something, forget that. Hit all the different parts of the system at once. Look at the discipline, look at the product, look at the innovation, deploy it all at once. That's what we did with the MOOC. We didn't do a pilot test, we just built something and tried it. Did it quick. Uh, Terry Anderson uh, talks about low cost failure. Fail often, fail easily. We're looking at a new perspective for institutions. I've designed a bit of a framework there. But the main idea here is that instead of doing things to people, we will instruct you, we will show you, we will provide an education. Instead of doing that, help people. Help people do what they want to do. If you have to ask, how do we motivate our students, you are doing the wrong thing because you were trying to get them to do something they do not want to do. You should be thinking of sharing your knowledge and acting as a support to help them do what they already want to do.
the new learning paradigms. We talked about learning as a path from beginning to end, sequence, prerequisite, covering subjects, going through grades, being first in class, last in class, meeting learning objectives. We need to change this because people, our students, ourselves, aren't worried about that. What we're interested in is the knowledge itself, the field rather than the progression. Covering it, looking for new ideas, solving problems with it, discovering new things, etc. Our courses, the Connectivist MOOC, did not look like a course. There was no curriculum. There was no body of knowledge that people tried to learn. It was not structured as a linear path. It was structured as a network. And in that network, we seeded it with open educational resources. And people will talk about that at this conference. And we encouraged our participants to create and share new resources. And we built some software to provide that. It's a different picture of a course. We focus on personal learning based on practice rather than personalized learning based on content. And I could do a whole talk about this one slide. We are interested in helping and supporting finding opportunity rather than testing, correcting, and defining requirements. You see, it's a different picture. It solves different problems. We are interested in learning outcomes in the sense that a whole person is being created. You do not acquire knowledge. Learning is not the accumulation of a series of facts. The product of learning is not knowledge. The product of learning is the learner, him or herself. We are developing and growing ourselves. And we do that in a learning network. Oops. Stop that. This is the new model the new benefits, the new goals of innovation and transformation. A model based on sharing, and our job as teachers and instructors is to share. Not to push, but to share. To make possible rather than required. Our purpose as institutions and teachers is to contribute to facilitate, to help. And our purpose as instructors and as institutions is to co-create with our learners and with our students. It's a different model of benefit that creates a different type of innovation, an innovation that is defined as transformation, which I argue is what we need in education today. So there I am. These slides are available at that web address because I share. And I thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so very much, uh, Mr. Stephen Dows. We get some insights uh, about the innova uh, disruptive innovation in learning. And uh, since uh, we are a few minutes behind the schedule, uh, actually, we uh, are going to have the refreshment break right now for 15 minutes. So could you please come back to this grand hall within 15 minutes? So enjoy the break. Thank you.